Hi, um, welcome to my chat today on Visible Maths, where we're going to look at uh, some te techniques that you can use in your classroom or in small group settings to build uh, mathematical concepts. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say thank you to the LDA for the chance to uh, present this, and also thank you for coming along and watching. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is pictorial to concrete abstract sequence. So the concrete stage is one that we're probably quite familiar with in the lower grades, but we tend to move away from in the upper grades. And that doesn't have to happen. We can continue to use things like blocks, things like Cuisinier rods to build concepts such as simultaneous equations. Won't be able to get to that today. There's only so much I can fit in 45 minutes. But concrete has its place in a classroom right up to lower secondary. Then once we've built the concrete stage, so again, MAB block counters, we move to the pictorial where we're representing uh, the equations and they can sort of look slightly different. Uh, some of them can be simply drawing the objects as they are before moving to some slightly more abstract representations, but using what's called proportional reasoning to represent the numbers and then we are moving to abstract which is just dealing with the numbers uh, the algorithms that we're used to in maths um, what I don't want to lose sight of is that even at the concrete and pictorial stage we would like to make sure that we are representing the abstract representation along the way so that when it comes to removing those supports students are able then uh, in a more efficient way to uh, move into those abstract representations and our final goal where practical is always to be able to solve those same questions mentally so we want to build those skills up so that we don't need these stages again we're practical okay so if we start with this question here Helen has five balls, James has six balls. How many balls do they have all together? So we start, we would actually get the balls out or get the objects out that the question is, and we'll be able to look at them. We can say that Helen has the blue ones, James has the red ones. Okay, and then we move on to putting them together and being able to count that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. All together, there are 11, we can do that. Um, we could then teach, well, we know there's five there, so six, seven, and so on. Um, after we've put together, we can use things like MAB blocks, Cuisinair rods, or other uh, multi-sensory tools to be able to represent the ball. So we're not using balls this time, but we're using blocks to represent a ball. So each block represents one ball. Um, same thing, there's five, there's six. And then we can use a pictorial representation uh, where we're actually drawing one square equals one ball. So we're still using that, uh, we're still being able to see and count the squares as we go. And we're labeling it clearly. Before moving on to the bar model, where we no longer have individual squares, we have a bar to represent Helen's part, a bar to represent James's part, and the total, okay? So this is slightly more abstract. And then we would finish off by using it to solve part plus a part equals a whole, five plus six equals 11. And then you would also use the abstract methods in the end to be able to read that question in the end, we would like students to be able to identify the operation. This is just a one-step problem. When we start to get to multi-step problems, which hopefully I'll have time to show you at the end, you'll see uh, how that gets built up. But as I said, through all of these stages, we are not just waiting until here to do abstract. When we make it, we also write five plus six on whiteboards. When we push, push them together, we also do five plus six and we work out our answer. And through each of these stages as we go, as well as representing it, we are still working on the abstract stage. 
okay, and we're always moving towards mental where practical. Okay, uh, I'll just go through a few demonstrations now of addition and subtraction. So let's just take a look here at um, some ways you can use manipulatives to show addition and subtraction. So in this one, as you can see, in this side, we've got four counters, and in this side, we have six counters. So these red uh, containers, or the containers with red underneath them, are parts, and the black is the whole. So we talk about addition is a part, plus a part equals a, a whole. So four plus six equals. Now we're going to add those together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So when we take our two parts and we add them together, we get our whole, which in this case is ten. Four plus six is ten. And what we can also show is that six. 7, 8, 9, 10. 6 plus 4 also equals 10. And using this same demonstration, we can flip that around to show that the whole, take away a part, equals a part. So our whole number, which is 10, take away a part. Let's take away the green. If I take away the green, I'm left with these yellow. So I'm taking away the green, and there are six of them. And I'm left with the yellow, and it equals a part, which is four. Ten, take away six, equals four. And I can show it the other way. Put those in there. This time I'm going to do 10, take away four equals, take away our four yellow counters, and I'm left with one, two, three, four, five, six. So I can use those manipulatives to play around and I can any addition, subtraction that will work where you've got a part plus a part equals a whole, part plus a part equals a whole, and the other way around, whole, take away a part equals a part, whole, take away a part equals a part. And there's a bit of a scope that you can move through uh, after showing those manipulatives. So, just put those to the side. So once you've built up that understanding, students, can actually, I'll write it up the top here, uh, four plus six equals 10, and we'll also do six plus four equals 10, 10 take away four equals six, 10 take away six equals four. So we, first way we can do is showing those number bonds and then we can just show that in the same way we've got 10 at the top one part is four the other part was six four plus six is ten six plus four is ten ten take away four is six ten take away six is four so we can see that relationship then we can move on to Build with blocks. So if you take this one here, our total was 10. One part was four. The other part was six. You can also do it using Cuisinair rods, which are a bit more abstract. So as you can see, they don't have the squares to count for you. 
So 10, 4, 6. 4 plus 6 is 10. 6 plus 4 is 10. 10 take away 4 is 6. 10 take away 6 is 4. And you can, you don't have to use what some people might call the 10 block. If you use Cuisinair rods, they encourage you to use the colours, not the number. Because you can also show that exact same thing using correct proportional relationship with these ones here. Our total is 10, 4 and 6. 10 take away 6 is 4, 10 take away 4 is 6 and so on. So using blocks, you can demonstrate it that way. Our next way is using some paper strips. So if you get out your strip of paper, now this is just some origami paper cut into strips. It's two-sided, so the, and you'll see why in a moment. So we start by identifying the total. In this case, it's 10. And our two parts are four and six. So just using our scissors and proportional reasoning, just cutting and turning one over. That's why we use the two-sided paper. We can easily cut and change the um, colour to identify the two different parts. So this one, four and six. And what you can also do here is you can show, I've got 10, if I take away 6, I'm left with 4. I've got 10, if I take away 4, I'm left with 6, and so on. Uh, and just on that one thing, also with these ones, they've got the hollow bottom. You can show it this way also. 10, take away 6, you're left with 4. 10, take away 4, you're left with 6. And then finally, we're moving to just the pictorial. Bar, so our total, we always start by drawing the arrow for the total. In this case, we know it, it's 10. Then we draw our bar and we draw the whole bar and then we divide it after that. So this is four and this is six. Now you can leave it like that or just like has happened all the way through, colour code using different colours to identify the fact that it is, uh, n these parts are not the same. And when we get to multiplication and division, when they are equal parts, you want to colour them the same. So that's something for later on. So that's how you can start with these manipulatives and move through the scope to um, using the bar model, which you would primarily use uh, during problem solving. The important thing is you need to use this alongside the operations in your teaching. You can't just use it for problem solving, otherwise you're trying to teach two things at once. So you want students to be familiar with the operations in these representations, and it will assist in their uh, representations in problem solving. So that flow chart, this flow chart is really good at then building up that understanding of the operations. So you can have just this on display or you can have it interactive like I'm going to show here. So do you have the total? The answer is no. The next question, does it need to be split into equal parts or groups? If the answer is no, it must be addition. If you've got the parts and you're missing the total, it's addition. Because addition is a part plus a part equals a whole. Okay, so with this one here, I've got the parts, I'm missing the total, it must be addition. And I'm just asking the students to identify the operation here. I'm not asking them to solve it every time. I might stop on two or three as I go through. If I do 15 of these, I might stop on some and ask them to add them together, but I'm building the understanding of the concept. Okay, same thing with this one here. We've got the parts, we're missing the total, 23 plus 42. Now stop, do that on your whiteboards. Then we move on. You've also got the comparison addition. Same thing though, no total. We've got the two parts, it must be addition. 
We've got the, we're missing the total, we've got the two parts, must be addition. Okay, then we can start to look at some more slightly difficult problems uh, that students can build on. Now I've used a triangle, you can use X, it doesn't matter. I just wouldn't call it triangle. I wouldn't call it X, I'd call it an unknown number. There's a really good TED talk about where the origin of X is. I won't be able to go through the full story. Essentially, algebra is Arabic. It was translated into Spanish. They didn't have a symbol for sh, so they borrowed from the Greek alphabet, which then when it was translated into English, it became X. So X stands for the unknown or the unknown number. So an unknown number, take away 15 equals 23 plus five, so if I look at this question here, I could say, well, the unknown number is the total, 15 is a part, and 23 plus five is another part. And I can represent that as a bar model. So an unknown number is the total. 15 is a part, and 23 and five is the other part. So I can either work it out by adding them, I can add these two parts together, which gives us 28, and then I can rearrange it into an addition problem. Uh, 15 plus 28 equals our unknown number or vice versa. Same thing here, unknown number, take away eight equals 18. I should have done it the other way around, I guess. And so on, so we can see that the important language is unknown number, not triangle, not X or so on. We wanna get students to understand unknown number. Okay, equally this time, do I have the total? Yes. Notice the question is exactly the same. Does it need to be split into equal parts or groups? No, it must be subtraction. If you've got the total, you don't have all the parts, but, and it doesn't need to be split into equal groups, to find the missing parts, you've got to use subtraction. Subtraction is a whole, Take away a part equals a part. Oh, I've done these in the wrong order again. Um, I'll go through. I'll do this one here. Okay, so we've got our total, we've got a part, we're missing a part. So this would be 95. Take away 71 equals an unknown number. 148, take away 52 equals our unknown number. Again, this time, this looks slightly different. This is actually our total. We're finding how much smaller 13 is compared to 52. So. I don't have time to go through every uh, possible representation in this uh, PowerPoint. I'll have a link to a YouTube video, a YouTube channel I've got where you can have a look at more of these videos and demonstrations. Um, but so 52 take away 13 will tell you the difference between those numbers and that's what we're looking for. Same thing here to find the difference between 68 and 43. 68 is our total, 43 is a part. This is our missing part. All right, and then we can move into problem solving. So keys for consistency, representation of addition and subtraction. Let's read the question. Grade two was surveyed to find how many pet cats and dogs they will bring to school for pet day. There were 16 cats and 36 dogs. How many pets were going to be at pet day? So it would represent cats and dogs using our proportional reasoning to say, well, cats is smaller. It's around about maybe half of the dogs but I'm not going to use a rule to measure it because it's proportional reason, not measurement. So I then can color and clearly label the parts. I draw my total, which is missing. I don't know what the total is. I can put a question mark up there. Now we need to identify how many cats were there. There were 16 cats and there were 36 dogs. Okay. Now I can talk, the language being the key part. We do not have the total, but we have the two parts. 
They are not equal, so it must be addition. So 16 plus 36 equals 52. There were 52 uh, pets coming for the day. Let's read the question, change it slightly to make it a subtraction problem. Uh, so grade two was surveyed to find how many pet cats and dogs they would bring to school for a pet day. There were 52 pets coming for the day. If 16 of them were cats, how many dogs were there? So let's see, 52 is the total. There are 16 cats. The number of dogs is unknown. So 52 take away 16 will tell us how many is left over and how many dogs there were for the day. Now I'll go through and do some demonstrations of multiplication and division. Okay, just taking a look at multiplication and division. So if we have a look here, 2 times 4 equals 8, 4 times 2 also equals 8, 8 divided by 4 equals 2, 8 divided by 2 equals 4. Now one thing at the moment uh, for a multiplication problem, if someone asks you 4 2s or 2 4s, whichever one, it does not matter so much which way it's written. We want students to be flexible and understand that both they are uh, going to give you the same answer but when it comes to the representation we need to make sure that we're carefully reading what it says so to build the understanding through here it doesn't it's you just want them to understand the relationship between the two so in this one here slightly different to how we did our number bonds because we don't want them to be having the same representation uh, and get potentially getting confused between number bonds and fact families. So we do our total like this, and now, okay, so it's a number repeated a number of times equals our total, or our total shared between a number of groups equals a number in each group, and so on. So we can use that representation to show multiplication. Then if we go into our building box, we can show eight is our total. And we have one, two, three twos, four twos, five twos, and the way you represent that is you can see that there are four separate, I suppose it's a bit hard from the top there, um, seeing that there's four separate, only label one, uh, or if students early on want to be labelling all of them they can, I'll show what that looks like, but eventually want to get to the point where we know that if this is two, they're all the same colour, they have to be two also. And then, you can also do it this way. Total is eight. So, sorry, well, why did I do 10 up here? I apologise. In my mind from the last demonstration. So four, our total was eight. Eight shared between two groups equals four, or eight with four in each group equals two groups. I'll put that away though, because we'll run out of space. And equally, you can do it this way, eight is the total, not 10. And then again, two. And not getting fixed on that idea that those blocks can be one. You can also show it this way.
Okay, then moving on to our paper. So we've got our paper, our total is eight. Ooh. Okay, now we need to make four equal groups. So to make four, we get our piece of paper, we fold it in half, then we fold that half in half again. And now we should have one, two, three, four groups. And in each group, we have two. Or as I was saying before, if initially to build an understanding, you want to do it this way, you can, but the problem is that starts to become time consuming and you want them to understand that if this is two, the rest are also two. So you, you don't want to always be using that strategy, but you can initially to build the understanding. Um, also, you could do it. Just fold in, make two groups now. Ooh, eight is the total. I need to work on my eights. And in each group, there's four. Or the final way is let's make the total eight. Actually, the final way I will draw that because it will make more sense to draw. And then you've got your bar model, eight. Well, eight, draw your bar, and then divide it into four equal groups. So notice how I drew my bar and then I divided. That's what you want to be doing. You don't want to be adding. And each one has a value of two. And again, I said I was going to do that demonstration. I might save that for demonstration I'll do in the TV in a moment where you can see what happens if you have a problem solving question okay so 8 shared between you don't know how many groups equals 4 how would you how you would work that out obviously uh, if you know those multiplication fact families you'll be able to solve that but if it's bigger numbers for example when you don't know how many parts to share it between how you represent it that way. Now I am slightly running out of time so I need to try and move through this quickly if I can. So this time we're looking at multiplication. Do you have the total? No. Does it need to be split into equal parts of groups? Yes, so it must be multiplication. So again I'm only representing one of them because I want them to know if that's 12 these must also be 12. So this will be 12 times 1, 2, 3, 4. Multiplication is a number repeated a number of times to equal our total. So here we have our total. We've got four groups. There's three in each group. So this would be four, uh, three times four. Three in each group, four groups equals 12. This one here, we don't know the total. We know there are six groups. There's eight in each group. We can ask the question, how many groups? Six, how many in each group? Eight, so it must be six times eight. And then equally with division, do we have the total? Yes. Does it need to be split into equal parts or groups? Yes, it must be division. So this is 36 shared equally amongst four groups. How many in each group? Or the other representation I spoke about just before was if you do have the total, and it needs to be split into equal parts or groups. In this case, the total is 36, 
there's four in each groups in each group we just don't know how many groups there are so we represent it this way to show that there are missing groups but we don't know exactly how many that is okay so division is a total shared between groups equals a number in each group so 35 there are five groups so 35 divided by 5 equals a unknown number. 27 shared between three groups. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, 23 divided by 3. Uh, 27 divided by 3 it would be in this case because we've got three groups. The total is 27. So 27 divided by 3 will tell us how many in each group. This is our representation now of an unknown number of groups. So there's the total, uh, sorry, we don't know the number of groups. There's eight in each group and the total is 48. So this would be 48 divided by eight will tell us the number of groups. And if we're turning that into a word question, every week Ben got $15 pocket money. How much money would Ben have after five weeks if he didn't spend any? So for consistency, we draw our bar first. We share it into five equal parts after we've drawn the bar. <coughs> Excuse me. We do not know the total, but we know each equal part is worth five. Oh, uh, 15, sorry. So there are five groups of 15. So we do not have the total, but we have the equal parts so to find the answer would be 15 times five, which is 75. Let's read it as a division problem. Ben had $75 in savings. He saved the same amount each week for five weeks and had no money left over. How much money did Ben spend, ben spend each week? So once again, we've got the total, we've got the equal parts, 75 shared between five groups equals our unknown number. Let's change that question again. Ben had $75. If he spent $5 a week on his favourite magazine, how many weeks would his money last? So in this one, 75 is a total. Each week has $5. So 75 divided by 5 will tell you how many weeks. 15 weeks. Okay, now I'm just going to go through some visual representations of fractions percentages and ratios. Another good demonstration of how useful these sort of representations are is dealing with fractions, percentages and ratios and showing the relationship between those. So if I start with the fraction one quarter, I can use my strip of paper to demonstrate one quarter. So firstly, four is the denominator. So I need to fold my uh, piece of paper into four equal parts. Must be equal parts. And I'll just identify that they're equal parts. Okay, and then I need to colour in one of those equal parts. Now, if you wish, you could cut that out, flip it over, and so on. But colouring can be quite quick. Where that gets better is if you then start to ask, what is one quarter of 20? What my total is 20. I have four equal parts. So 20 divided by four equals five. Each equal part has a value of five, so one quarter of 20 is five. Equally, let's say instead of one quarter of 20, we wanted to identify three quarters of 20. So I start. I could have actually just used the uncolored part, I guess. But this way you say, the denominator tells you how many, how many parts to divide it into. 
the numerator tells you how many parts to colour in. Okay, so this time we're finding three quarters of 20. Once again, there are one, two, three, four equal parts. So 20 divided by four equals five. And we want to find out how much, what is the value of one, two, three equal parts. So if each equal part has a value of five, and we want to find three of them, five times three equals 15. Okay, and again, you can use that using the blocks or just doing, I should have done the total there. Your pictorial representation. And notice again, when I've done it, I drew my bar and then I divided. So that is three quarters of 20. is 15. Now again, percentages, you would want to show the relationship of fractions and uh, percentages. So, and, and even initially, provide this table so that they, they can relate it to what you've done with fractions. And then we can do it the exact same way. 75% of 20, same thing. We're finding 75%. When we draw it, there are four equal groups. So 20, just like over here, divided by four equals five. We want to find the value of three of those groups. So five times three equals 15. 75% of 20 oh, is 15. I did that a bit too close. Same thing, we can draw that. And all of a sudden we have demonstrated how and why fractions and percentages are so related. Different way of writing the question, same way of working it out. And finally, we can show ratios. So let's draw a ratio of three to one. I'll just A and B. B, so A has three equal parts, B has one equal part. Okay, there's my picture of a ratio of three to one. Three equal parts compared to one equal part. Share 20 at a ratio of three to one. So I've got my, uh, I've got my representation here. Uh, I'll draw my total, which is 20. And one thing I am going to do, I'll use a different color, is I'm going to color them in all the same color because I want the visual representation that they are all the same. Alright, so share 20 at a ratio of 3 to 1. So our total is 20. How many equal parts do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4. 20 divided by 4 equals 5. So each equal part has a value of 5. So B is 5. And A is five in each group, and there are three of them, which is 15. So 
So once again, we can actually see the relationship between fraction and ratios. And why, I suppose, one common misconception would be that that is one third. It is not that's three quarters compared to one quarter. Three quarters compared to one quarter. We need to think about the total parts. So there's just, again, another way that you can work in the classroom with fractions, percentages, and ratios before you move into the problem solving side of things. Okay, so we're gonna get through this last bit quite quickly. So what is a good strategy to come up with when you're going to introduce those representations, when you're going to teach them, and when you're going to revise them through all of the operations, as well as things like fractions, uh, percentages, ratios, like you saw. Uh, so that then we know we're going to have a consistent methodical approach from prep right through to the end of primary school. And as I said, that can go into secondary school if that's what your setting uh, provides. Also along with that, come up with an agreed way of representing each operation. So that's not to say that mine, you might draw rather than arrows, you might have uh, lines with just uh, vertical lines on the end. Just come up with an agreed way so that you're not teaching new things every year. You've got the same representation throughout your school. So let's read this question here. John and five of his friends share 84 stickers equally among themselves. How many stickers did two of his friends receive all together? So we read through the question, then we go through and we circle the key numbers. Five, 84, two. Okay, underline the question. How many stickers did two of his friends receive all together? And we box the key maths action words. John, share equally how many two of his friends all together. And then we can start to draw. Now, I've got that ready to go on the uh, screen, but what I like to do as well is before I show that and go through with the students, so they all see it twice, I actually draw it as well. So we have our total, which is 84. Okay, and we've got John and five of his friends, which means we've got six equal parts. So I draw my bar and then I divide it into six equal parts. Okay, and then I'm going to find how many two of his friends, how many stickers two of his friends received. Okay, so first step is to find what's one equal part. We need to know what one equal part is before we can find two. 84 divided by six, because there are six equal parts, equals 14. I need to go through this quickly. So each equal part is worth 14. Two equal parts must then be worth 20. Eight. So two of his friends receive 28 stickers all together. We go through here. One equal part, two equal parts, 28 stickers. Now, the other way this is, the other way you can think of this as visual algebra is you're actually saying six equal parts equals 84. Two equal parts equals what? So 84 divided by 6, x equals 14. 2x equals an unknown number. 2 times 14 equals 28. So it's a slightly different way of doing algebra, but you can do it at a much lower grade than maybe traditionally we have uh, because you're introducing it in such a visual way and answering at the end oh two friends received 28 stickers i apologize okay i won't get to draw this one because i won't have enough time this might be our last one uh, i'll put up a link in a moment for where you can go to watch a scope and sequence videos of grade two right through to grade six. 
So a shopkeeper has 183 files. This was 46 less than the number of folders he had, the number of spiral notebooks he had was 30 less than the number of folders he had. How many spiral notebook, notebooks did the shopkeeper have? Circle key numbers. Underline the question and box key maths action words. And then we go through and we start to solve. So we've got the files. We know there's 183. We draw that. Now, this was 46 less than the number of folders he had. So we would have 183 folders plus 46. And then if we draw the number of spiral notebooks. So the spiral notebooks is the same as this less 30. So what we need to do is find out how many folders that is and then take away 30. So we find the number of folders. 183 plus 46 is 229. There are 229 folders. There are 30 less spiral notebooks. 229 take away 30 is 199. So we're not asking students to do maths that we haven't introduced. We're not asking students to do maths that we haven't uh, taught and think they have sound knowledge. We're showing them how to access the question, how to break it down, because that on its own is quite a lot of information. Okay, I think I'm going to have to finish up there because I know, so, as I said, that is just about my time up. So just some resources you can use. So youtube.com slash junior maths. I've got these in channels. I'm adding to them uh, over the holidays as well. So I have all of grade two problem solving questions done. You need to do a bit more revision there. I've got all of grade three's units done. I've got the first units done in grade four, five, and six as well as some other representations of using blocks to use uh, of all four operations. So have a look at those. Uh, also, the maths model drawing made easy and inspiring, three and four, there's also a five and six book. That's what I've used to break down uh, into year levels. You'll have to pull it apart because some in five, six you could introduce earlier, some in three, four, you probably need to wait until the older grades to introduce as well as this series here by Yat Ben Ha. Uh, they've also got ones on fractions, percentages, ratios, and so on. Uh, that's about a five book series. I think they're really good at teaching how to uh, use the bar model. But thank you for watching. And once again, thank you to the LDA for the opportunity to share this information. I think I've run a little bit over time.